am super excited to welcome the team from uh, Rakuti Confections, who are going to lead you on this beautiful chocolate journey that you have in front of you. So with that, they are well prepared, and I'm going to step out of the way. I'll be uh, in the audience with you for questions throughout, but to you. Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Are we, uh, are we on? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. It's like a cell phone, right? So hello, my name's Michael Ricuti. Um, uh, I have Amanda here, who is our genius in production, and Jackie Ricuti uh, over there. Jackie is a creative director for the brand, um, keeps an eye on me and everything else, <laughs> and kind of keeps it mo moving. And she's also created these beautiful uh, little brochures, which was like, took it one step beyond. It's beautiful. Um, so what we're going to do is, is that if you see up on these screens here, there, um, we're going to switch it up in a little bit and focus the cameras on what Amanda will be doing in um, an actual making of the chocolate. But the screens will just be kind of running an ongoing piece here as far as what we're going to do. But what I'll, what I'll do prior to that is just talk a little bit about Rakuti Confections. I'm not quite certain if everybody's familiar with the company. Uh, we're, uh, Jackie and I started the company in 1997 in San Francisco. We actually conceptualized it like five years prior while we were working in Vermont. And then we worked our way back to San Francisco because um, we knew we wanted to move back to San Francisco and start this chocolate company. Uh, so we started it in the in dog patch area where we still have our factory. We've been there for 20 years. Uh, this is our 20th year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and so we um, you know we you know we we keep it going and everything we do is in house. We do pretty much uh, you know, all the manufacturing, all the shipping. Everything happens within this one facility. We just got through Valentine's, so we're here for Valentine's Day. Uh, happy Valentine's Day for everyone! And uh, what a perfect way to taste and experience some chocolates. What I have, what you have in front of you, um, I would prefer if you just would. Um, I will cue you when we want you to taste them, and we're going to go through a series of steps in tasting the chocolates. Um, so what's happening here is we're just trying to create an expression of how we, how we actually infuse flavors into the chocolate. So there's different ways of doing it, but what we're doing is, is that this particular example is, is that we're doing a lavender and vanilla uh, bonbon. So what, what is the, one of the steps is, is that we create an infusion with lavender, with fresh lavender. And we get all of our herbs, we get all of our teas, um, everything from different farmers. For example, like the lavender comes from Dixon from Eatwell Farms. We have tarragon from Mar Marikita Farms in um, uh, Watsonville. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, we have lemon verbena from uh, Dixon. Uh, eat well farms and then what we're doing with all of these herbs is is that we actually we gather the herbs we get the herbs from the farmers we pick it up at the farmers market and we actually dry them slow dry them we don't dry them with a lot of heat and then we wash them we dry them and then we we use those herbs to create our infusions versus buying herbs in a bag from somebody that we're not quite certain how old they are and usually they have all sorts of other funny things in them like bugs and sand and little pebbles and all so on and so forth. So we, we were, yeah, I don't know, when Jackie and I started the company, I think we're just real control freaks. And we've kind of maintained that level of just control uh, and we haven't changed that ever since then. So we just, you know, we, if you look at the video here, here, you know, right now, what's happening is, is that there is the lavender being picked. You know, we pick the lavender, um, we dry the lavender, and then after the lavender's dry, we create an infusion. Uh, we do an infusion, and there's the cream up there right now. And we let that sit for a specific amount of time. When you're doing different types of infusions and you're flavoring, one of the, some of the things you have to think about, and we're going to taste an infusion here, but some of the things you have to think about is, is that you, you, when you create an infusion, you want to, if you taste it, and when you taste it, it's going to be really strong. The reason why it's really strong is because you have a lot of other ingredients that you have to add to the infusion. Um, you don't want to... If you make the infusion and it tastes like palatable and drinkable um, and not too strong, and when you go to add all the other ingredients, you won't taste anything. But if it's, 
you also have to just be mindful of like how intense you want it, especially something like lavender. I mean, I think that when we first started out, there was someone that said, lavender, it tastes like, isn't it? It's like, don't they use that in soap and lemon verbena? They use that in soap. Yeah, they do, but it's a beautiful flavor if you don't uh, take advantage of it. So we really try to be mindful of the actual flavor, and I think when Amanda's working with it, when we get a fresh crop in, we, we might alter our steeping times a little bit or play around with it when you actually have to taste it. You know, um, normally in a recipe we have very specific times and everything is by that time, and usually we can stick with that. But if for some reason, you know, something might seem a little bit more intense or the lavender, it depends on the season, we just have to be careful that we don't over-infuse it or under-infuse it. Um, and then like when we're working with teas, for example, we only use about, uh, we use a lot of tea for a very short period of time versus like a little bit of tea for a long period of time. Because if you use a little bit of tea and infuse it, it's very much like making tea at home where you're just going to, if you keep on using it over and over again, or if you steep it for a long period of time, you're going to extract all of these really unpleasant uh, acids and oils. Um, so you have to do it very quickly two to three to five minutes, seven minutes, depending on what it is, and it's always about tasting. And then we get it off as quickly as possible. So we use, a lot of times when we're doing these infusion processes, we use a lot of product, a lot of lavender, um, a fair amount, a lot of Villama verbena, tarragon, so on and so forth. And some things are cold infusion. For example, like tarragon, you know, we might heat the cream up a little bit and then we'll add the tarragon and we'll sit it in the pot, we'll wrap it, we'll place it in the refrigerator and let it sit overnight. And then the next day we warm it up a little bit and then we strain it off and then remove with using like something like a cheesecloth. We'll strain strain it through there so we capture all of the, whatever it is we're infusing, you know, if whatever herb or tea, and then we squeeze that off. And then we use that flavored cream to make our ganache, which is our centers, which we'll be tasting here as well. So with the lavender, we steep the lavender, we strain it off, you have a little, little cup of lavender. The next step is, is that we actually make the ganache. Um, we have the chocolate that we use to make the ganache, which we're going to be tasting, and then the next piece. So if you're looking at your, if you're looking at your piece like this, um, so from your your from your left you have the little oval piece, and then to your right should be the cup, um, facing you. Mm -hmm. So the first piece would be the chocolate that we're actually using to make the interior of the chocolate, which is the ganache, and then the second piece is the actual is the actual. Uh, a, the ganache itself that's not coated. And then the third piece is the chocolate that we're using to actually coat and dip the chocolate. And then the fourth piece is the finished piece of chocolate. And we'll talk about that little design on the chocolate as well. And then the piece after that is, um, what we try to do is um, we have a recipe in here. We talk about you know, um, you know, making this chocolate. But um, to create this square piece and dip it, it's, it's not like you can't do it. It's not impossible. But it, it's a lot easier to do like a rolled truffle. So we, we included a rolled truffle. And Amanda's going to demonstrate a rolled truffle. So we can kind of do that as well. Um, but it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's important to really just understand how that all works. Um, we can get into a variety of different things. I think it's just a matter of how much time. Um, we can talk about um, tempering chocolate, and Amanda can talk about tempering chocolate. She actually just did an amazing uh, uh, tempering uh, a, a demonstration of tempering chocolate to really show people what that means. Uh, so on our next Google visit, We'll do that, yeah, Amanda. But it's really fascinating. I was even blown away because it's like it's something that she experienced, I think, at a demonstration, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then she and then she demonstrated it in front of this class that we had at our kitchen, and I was like, wow, that really makes a lot of sense because it really draws towards the crystallization of chocolate and how it works and so on and so forth. I think so. we'd love all those types of tips and tricks. It's fun. It's it's really cool. The, yeah, always the more science, the better. We can definitely drop some science into it, and Amanda can definitely speak of, uh, she likes to speak of science uh, as well, and she's very technically uh, inclined. Um, do we get to taste anything yet? So what we, what, so what we would I like to do all is, is that, um, what I would say is, is that we could, if we could start switching over to the camera um, for hands, and then Amanda's slowly going to start working on uh, an infusion. And so uh, the infusion will be by heating up the cream um, 
and also adding the lavender to that and then straining it off. Um, so now the things, some of the things to think about is, is as I said, is, is that, you know, like with chocolate, uh, making chocolate, there's a lot of temperature sensitivity uh, depending on what you're doing. Like sometimes you don't bring things to a roaring boil and then you pour, like for example, like if you're making tea, you know, it's better to kind of bring it to a specific temperature, either if it's boiling, but drop it down and then, and then add your tea and then wait for a specific amount of time and then uh, remove it so that you get all, you receive all the wonderful flavors of the tea, but not all the, the, the off flavors of the tea. The same with the lavender. And la like I said, lavender is very intense. So it's, um, it's really important to just kind of keep that going. Did you want to talk a little bit about yeah, what just, you're doing um, here? Yeah, just to point out, not just uh, paying attention to what lavender you're mm -hmm. using, but all the ingredients that you're using. It's really important to know what you're using. For example, this is a heavy cream. So its fat content is around 35%. That's going to be important when you go to put your ganache together. Um, we're basically going to make an emulsion, and that is um, stabilizing your fat within the water um, and in any other uh, dry solids that would be inside uh, your ganache. So if you used a different kind of cream or you thought, oh, I have half and half, I can use that, your ganache is not going to act the same way, right? It's all a balance between fat, water, and solids. So. Right now we have a heavy cream that we're going to heat up. When we talk about um, the butter, the butter is a European style butter, so it's an 83% fat, um, so much higher than what you would normally get at the grocery store. You'll need to look for a specific European style high fat content. So just want to throw that in there. <laughs> the other thing is, is that she talked, um, we, we talk, talking a little bit about emulsion. Um, so has every, has that, uh, so, Making a ganache is like making, um, for example, like making mayonnaise in some respects. But I mean, it's different because you're not playing around with the same temperatures. But you're also, what you're trying to do is merge two different types of fats together. Because you have, you, have, um, you have your cream, you have your butter, and you have your cocoa butter, which is in your chocolate. So um, these are all at very specific temperatures. So Amanda's con controlling these temperatures um, in order for to create an emulsion. And what she'll do is she will demonstrate an emulsion. I don't know, are you going to demonstrate it like in a bowl here? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're going to do? So, mm -hmm. so demonstrate an emulsion. So when you're making, has, has everyone made mayonnaise before? So it's the same, similar. You know, if you add, start adding oil, oil to the egg yolks um, and then you're going to add some sort of acid, you have to slowly kind of create that core in order for it to come together. If you just pour it in really quickly, everything will start splitting. You'll, it'll be really difficult to put, put it together. And then the last stage is, is that Amanda had a very specific uh, temperature for the butter. The butter is probably 68, 70 degrees, 72, I usually 68. do by, by eyesight on um, actual texture, um, just because it can change so differently between your room temperature. Um, if it's really cold out, if your uh, ganache itself is too cold, you may have to play with the, the butter a little bit. You have to be flexible anytime with working with chocolate. It doesn't want to do exactly what you want it to do. You kind of do what it wants you to do, and then you get to the, to the right place together. It's like beurre blanc when you're making a beurre blanc, when you're starting to add butter to it. Um, sometimes the butter's like really soft and you can squeeze it through your fingers, but you know, you mm -hmm. might have, you, what you're working with on the stove that you have to add the butter to might be a little bit cooler, so you can add cooler butter. Um, so that, or you can have the temperature of the butter dictate like the consistency that you're working with, you know, based on the temperature of the chocolate. So this is like one of the most important parts um, as far as making chocolate is, uh, is the actual ganache part. The infusion part is, uh, is really kind of open, it's an open forum, and you can do a lot to it. If you, you might be like, oh, I would, add, I would have added a lot more lavender, or I would have like done that completely differently. That, this, is like a, this is like what we do, but this, there, there's so many other ways to do it. Um, you know, you can right. make it stronger, you can make it weaker, you can do whatever. It's not like this isn't written in stone. So um, the cream is now warm enough. I uh, saw a little bit of steam come off. I'm gonna go ahead and add in my lavender and just stir that well to make sure that all of the lavender buds um, become saturated with the liquid and release all of those great smells and oils. 
And We're so, going to do a little bit of TV magic as well. We won't make you sit here for 20 minutes as right. the steeps. So, There's uh, something I prepared earlier. Right. Um, and then what we had when, before, prior to you walking into the room, we had a pot of lavender and water um, and then a pan of cocoa, cacao nibs. So the cacao nibs, just to kind of give you like this like experience of like these are some of the things that were the products we're working with, um, these are the aromas, the flavor, um, and it just it just it just kind of sensitizes everybody. So. I brought this one up to 45 um, Celsius. So you wanted about 115 Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. Um, it's basically right before it wants to boil. You'll start to get that steam rise. So. So uh, 20 minutes later, right? We're going to go ahead and uh, strain this. So I have a chinois, a nice um, fine mesh strainer, and then um, cheesecloth. Um, you can use a different kind of strainer if you want, but the main thing is that you want to get those um, large particles out of there as much as possible. It's not going to give you a nice mouthfeel when you blend that into your beautiful chocolate. So we'll go ahead and strain that out. So while she's straining that out, if you would like to, your little plastic cup, if you would like to taste. Now, I wouldn't chug it. And maybe it's, give it just a little bit of a swirl. I yeah, noticed that it, the vanilla kind of settled to the bottom, so give it just a, a, a subtle swirl there. Yeah, so this is, your, this is your infusion, and you have to remember that the infusion is, we're making it strong because it's diluted. Um, because you're adding other ingredients. You figure you're adding cream, you're adding butter, you're adding chocolate. So the percentage of this has to really flavor all of that. So when you're making, the, when you're doing these types of projects, keep in mind that your base ingredient flavor has to really match up and compete with all the other flavors. So if this is like 20%, you have an additional 80% of un, not unflavored product. I mean, because chocolate has wonderful flavor. But you don't want, you want to make sure that you can taste the chocolate, you can taste the infusion. I mean, our goal at Rikuti Confections is, is to be able to taste the chocolate key, but also have a subtle background of the infusion. So it's not, so when you taste the lavender confection, it's not a lavender bomb. But at the same time, the lavender is there. You, you can actually kind of feel the bud. It's really wonderful. It's just really, it's just this like nice little kind of flavor profile, but at the same, we really like the chocolate to showcase the chocolate because the chocolate's really important. Um, the chocolate and that we're using is the chocolate to, the le to your left, um, which is that little oval piece there, and it's a 70%. Um, that chocolate comes from Valrona, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the chocolate that we're using, actually using to make the ganache. Um, and you can do different percentage chocolates. A lot of people ask, well, can I go higher? I like low, I don't like, I would rather use less, you know, less sugar or less sweet chocolate. If you really start to go really high in percentages of, 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 of chocolate, what happens is, is that you have to think that there's all these particles. So here, um, is everyone familiar with what um, chocolate's about as far as, you know, like when someone says, when someone says that there's a uh, you know, percentage of chocolate, these are the cacao nibs. So if there's a percentage of chocolate, um, if this is like 30% of, if it's a 70% chocolate, that means you're adding an additional 30% of sugar. So if you add, if you have use like a 90%, you only have 10% of sugar. So when these beans are ground down, they actually have a starch component to them and they'll find a lot of the moisture and they'll start to dry out the uh, actual ganache. So when you go really, really high percentages, you end up a adding more additional liquids that needs to find other liquids from another place. So you really bring it back down to like that, that same number, but you might not be using the same number is in the chocolate. The chocolate might be 90%, but then all of a sudden you're adding another 20% sugar or you're adding additional cream or butter because you still have to match that. So it's really a calculation. Mm -hmm. um, the calculation doesn't really change that much. You don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of room, flexibility for it to change. Right. So the, the ganache that we're making today is going to be made with a 70% um, chocolate, like Michael had mentioned. So in that 70%, if you use brand A 70% versus brand B 70%, the actual cocoa solids and cocoa butter that make up that 70% might be a little bit different. So they're 
both of those numbers are indicating about 30% of that chocolate is made up of sugar, but there could be a different balance. So if you try it one day with um, brand A, 70%, and then you try it again next week with a different brand, you may get a different result. It may be um, stiffer, it might be softer, just depending on how much cocoa butter is actually contained within that chocolate. So That's right, because yeah. it's, never, it's never right down the line, 50-50. Right. That's yeah. very unlikely. You know, like a c cacao bean, those beans I have in my hand have 50%, close to 50, plus or minus 50% cocoa butter or fat, you know, in them. And so that cocoa butter, when you make chocolate, like if you take that chocolate and just put it, place, like weigh it out and, and weigh out, if you want to make a 70% and you weigh out whatever percentage of that weight is and then take 30% of sugar, just put it in a coffee grinder and grind it. Just grind it away. It'll liquefy because the cocoa butter, once it starts to warm up, it'll liquefy and you'll start to make a really, really rough, raw chocolate. It's not, you know, like this gentleman over here made some chocolate that he would like us, like, like me to taste. I don't think it's enough for the whole room, but um, it was pretty impressive uh, what he can't. 24 hours. What he, yeah. Mm -hmm. I measured it. You know, <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. That's like a good mouth feel. But you know, it's funny that the what the micron size is just exactly what he talked about. When you when you increase your percentage of chocolate and you start liquefying it and you don't add enough liquid, all of a sudden those particles are going to seem larger. They're going to feel larger. You know, you're going to have a whole different mouth feel. So that that ganache that this recipe for this ganache here, if you use if you replace it with a ninety percent. The next thing you're going to feel is if you don't change everything else, it's probably going to be bitter. You're going to pull out some volatile acids because the ch cacao is so much stronger. The the beans, the percentage of bean sugar, and um, it'll start. You'll start to feel the particle size just a touch. So I'm going to go ahead and add our invert sugar to the cream, mm -hmm. the infusion that we've just done, as well as uh, as our lavender, or I'm sorry, vanilla. So the invert sugar does several things in our ganache. One, obviously, is its sweet power. So invert sugars typically are going to be, if you're looking at the, the sweetness range, if um, granulated sugar is 1, 100%, if that's it, your standard, um, an invert sugar is going to be closer to 125. So like, think about like a honey. A honey is an invert sugar. So it's going to have that kind of sweetening power. It's a really low glycemic level. Yeah. Yeah. If you're talking about something like glucose um, or like a corn syrup, something like that, it actually has less sweetening power than a granulated sugar. So it's closer to about 70, between 70 and 80 of that sweetening power. So that's going to add sweetness to our product, but it's also going to affect the texture and it will help us with um, moisture retention. So that's actually going to help it so that over time our ganache doesn't just dry out. It doesn't like uh, dry and crack. It's going to stay nice and smooth um, after it's enrobed or after you've rolled it. And that's just because it um, will hold on to that water without that water escaping back into um, the environment. It also, it also doesn't recrystallize okay. when it's inverted. So if you, like, say, for example, if you were to heat cream um, and just add granulated sugar to it, to this mixture here, and you, you could boil it, you could dissolve it, you could liquefy it, but most likely it'll go back to its natural state and start growing again. And it's like when you dip the little string in the jar and hang it and you know, the crystals form. It'll just, it, it would like to recrystallize. So an inverted sugar um, through either acidulation um, is uh, you kind of keep those crystals from forming, reforming and relinking themselves. Um, and that's the most important part for us because then we also, it, it it's, it's helps with moisture, it helps with texture, but it also just the fact that we don't have to worry about it recrystallizing. So that's why we have to use something like that. I think in the recipe here, you can use corn syrup, you know, or, and you could find non-GMO corn syrup at um, like Whole Foods in different places, Rainbow. Um, that's the easiest, most accessible sugar, but you can find uh, trimaline or uh, inverted sugar online. They do sell it. Uh, mm -hmm. When I released my cookbook, Chocolate Obsession, many moons ago, I think, um, we, talk, we, we wanted to talk about using uh, an inverted sugar versus corn syrup. And uh, we gave some ideas of where you can buy them in sources. And, uh, so you can it's make not, it at home it, as well. There's some yeah. recipes. So if you're really interested in it, um, you can actually find a lot of information on it. It's pretty um, cool. Online. Yeah. 
Um, actually, it's a vanilla powder, so it's actually the beans from the inside of the pod um, that are already outside of the pod for us. It's probably easier to find, um, but that actually has other water in it that you'd have to, um, to kind of consider when you're talking about your ganache. But you can just scrape from a vanilla bean. So if you get one at the, the grocery store, you can just split it and scrape it. Um, and vanilla is like quadrupled right now in price. It's unfortunately, like ridiculously yeah. expensive. We'll see if they come, the prices come back down after uh, this year's crop this summer. So we're hoping. Yeah, just farming, there was just, yeah, there was some bad, there were some diseases. There was also just really bad seasons mm -hmm. um, throughout. Low crop. Um, it, depends on, it depends on where it, it comes from. I mean, you know, like in its natural habitat, there's a, there's a lot of the, not, there's the insects and the bugs can pollinate. But then you look, you look at, like, um, for example, like areas like in Hawaii, they grow vanilla, but they don't have the right bugs to kind of, deliver and pollinate so they have to hand pollinate every single orchid you know and they have like a three-day window and so they're talking thousands and thousands and if they hand pollinate it that doesn't mean they're going to hit the mark you know so um, they you know it's really it's really expensive and it's a t it's a touch and go situation yeah. do we want to taste the 70 yeah, percent while do you you're doing that and then yeah. you want to talk about the emulsion yeah which is this is kind of a cool part so the 70 percent is the chocolate that amanda um, has, so we have melted here. It's melted. It's in the bowl. And that temperature is at about 40 some odd degrees Celsius, 115, 120 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit. Yeah, we usually try to keep, for this method of ganache, we keep our um, chocolate melted and the infusion about the same temperature. So it's typically around 40 uh, to 42 Celsius. I think it's like 104 to 110, something like that in Fahrenheit. You really want to have it like like with like, you know, temperatures. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have these really, these temperature swings in, in ingre with ingredients and then you add your butter, what's going to happen is, is that once you add that butter especially, it's going to split. Yeah. And you're going to really have a difficult time bringing it back together. So you'll see a lot of different methods for ganache making. Some people like to boil their cream and pour it over solid chocolate. Um, sometimes the butter would be melted in with the cream. Um, there's no wrong way to make it. It's up to you what kind of result you want. Each of those methods is going to give you a slightly different result. So you maybe will find differences in how you taste the ganache. You could do the exact same recipe side by side with a different method. And maybe one would actually come across to you as more chocolate. Maybe you would get more of those notes where the other one, maybe it tastes more buttery to you just because the butter is what melts um, last on your tongue depending on what method you've used. So for us um, in production, we use the same method for all of our ganaches. Um, and this is the method that we use where it's this, almost the same temperature and we're using melted chocolate. Not everyone has that luxury, but we actually have um, just a giant room that is heated that we can keep melted chocolate all the time. So we're going to go ahead and start to uh, bring our emulsion together. So I'll add about half of the infusion to our chocolate. And then I'm going to start by hand, um, just kind of mixing that in uh, to create our emulsion that we talked about. Um, you want to not use a whisk. Sometimes people will show you that. I've seen demonstrations with whisks. Um, in our case, we don't like to use whisks. It just incorporates air bubbles. Um, and when you're working with a product like a ganache, a chocolate, that does have a shorter shelf life, um, you don't want to incorporate air. That gives um, space for bacteria and things like that to grow. So we try to keep that down to a minimum as possible. So you can see it kind of broke. Like it's not as shiny, um, it doesn't look very even at the moment. You can kind of see that around the outside. And then as we continue to stir, you'll see it actually does come together kind of like a mayonnaise does, where it's now it's like thicker. Um, you can see the texture has changed. Um, and we'll just continue to stir. You just get a, it, it, it's, uh, I mean, you're basically, it's like uh, the end result, it looks like a really good chocolate pudding. You know, like some, the same, like you get out of the box, the jello pudding, it's awesome. You know, it's, uh, but it tastes so much better because it's like, you know, real, really good product. But it should be shiny and smooth. And when you see a really good mayonnaise, it should be shiny and smooth. Uh, a lot of times mayonnaise is a little bit split or it'll be, when it has like a matte finish to it, 
you know you've done something wrong and the emulsion's not really, um, hasn't really taken. So I think what Amanda's, you know, just demonstrating here is, is that it's really important to create that core. So you're creating that core and she's just kind of working it in and then she's bringing all of the other ingredients into that core. So it's like the mother, you know, it's like a starter. You know, you're creating this, pe this, this core piece, the temperatures are starting to align, and then, you can, then she's starting to slowly bring in the remaining ingredients on the outside and bring the, work them in without a lot of really vigorous work. And also, like she said, not using a whisk. It's really important not to use a whisk. Um, you'll just run into different results. There are, there are recipes, and I think we've had people ask these questions numerous times, is that there are recipes for ganaches that are whipped. So you can take this ganache and you can whip it with like, say for example, like in a stand mixer, like a Hobart stand mixer, or you could whip it by hand. It's easier to do it with a mixer or, you know, like one of these electric mixers. And you get this like lighter, fluffier ganache. It doesn't have a long shelf life. It just has a whole different experience. It's a little drier, but it's a little different, but it's, it's a, there's, there's, there's chocolatiers all over the world that make whipped ganache mm -hmm. that they fill in bonbons. So if you mess it up, you can always whip it. <laughs> Just whip it. It still tastes good, right? Yeah, it is. Great ingredients. Um, so with a batch this size, I'm going to go ahead and switch the immersion blender just so it can really tighten that emulsion and it will be um, stable for us. So while she's making... This piece here, you can. Um, this might be a perfect opportunity to taste the ganache, which is a little square um, that is um, uncoated. Um, what the next step will be that it'll be coated with uh, a milk chocolate. So you'll feel it's like it's like a it's like butter. It's really smooth. It's really delicate, um, but it's still by having that that. We're also thinking about, you know, when you add the milk chocolate on the outside, that is also um, an element that we're considering when we're looking at the whole flavor profile of the piece. Um, so it really needs a little bit more than just the, just the plain ganache. You really need to have that other part so that it, it really has a balance to it as well. So now if you can see on the screen, we have something that's very shiny, um, it's nice and thick and viscous. Um, that's a sign of a good emulsion. So now that we're here, we can um, stop and we'll start to add the butter in. So again, we, our method um, stays with everything kind of on that same temperature. We don't want that our ganache is so warm that it actually melts our butter, but we don't want our butter so cold that it like sets and seizes our ganache. So you can kind of see it's like, it's soft. Um, still opaque, it's not melted, um, but definitely more fluid than you would have just at a normal room temperature. So I'll add that in two stages. Yeah, like if you melt butter and just liquid, it's liquid and you add it to it, you're, you're just going to, it's going to be a train wreck. Yeah, it's not going to be good. And it's really difficult to bring it back. You can, it's almost impossible to bring it back, back once it's split. So that's why it's very important to have these temperatures. But it's not that challenging to do that. It's just that you have to be mindful of like, my chocolate's at this temperature, my cream's at this temperature. Um, you can always heat your cream and then you're gonna bring it down. And while your cream's uh, arriving at the temperature you lo you're looking for, your chocolate might have cooled. So you can bring it up just a tiny bit just to warm it up a little bit. So, um, you know, you just have to play with it. It's a balancing act, but that's like the, the most important part at what Amanda's doing now in making this piece. And this is, like we said, this can be used for making the truffles, we casting and making the little squares that you just tasted. Um, so there's a variety of things you can do with it. You could actually, you could, you could, we use a different recipe for filling molds. It has a little bit different consistency, a little softer, <clears throat> but you could fill molds with it as well. But it's a little bit tight for molded chocolate. So in so. production, we do about 20 times this size. That would be like our standard size, slow season batch. <laughs> so it yields about, what, like a few thousand pieces or something? Yes. So like it, um, it's, this size frame is 225 pieces, and uh, batch size is 20 frames. So. Who have attempted to work with chocolate before, it can be very difficult. Like, 
like you said, and you're making it look like it's so well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, chocolate's a really fun product to work with. Um, it's almost like it's alive. Every day it's a little bit different. If your room is really hot or if it's really humid out, your chocolate's going to act different. Um, so I know at the beginning when you first start working with chocolate, whether or not you're tempering chocolate or making ganaches, it can be very frustrating because not every day it works the same way. And you think, what did I do different? It's always the same for mm -hmm. me. But the more and more you work with it, um, you know, the more you get to know it and you can kind of see those reactions. Bakers do the same thing with their bread doughs. Um, you know, they all look the same to me because I don't do bread. But to them, there's like such a subtle difference. Well, yeah. um, there's hydration yeah. with water. If it's really humid out, you add less water. The flowers, they're winter flowers. There's summer wheat, different types of flowers. So they all have different hydration levels. So you have to really pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Definitely it's really funny. Science. Amanda and I did a class in um, L.A. for guitar with Guitar, uh, their kitchen in, in um, Culver City, and uh, and all three of us were there. You know, <laughs> we wanted to make these little discs as samples to, for people to taste. So here we have like Amanda has a, a ton of experience, me, and then Donald Russell who has like a. a a lot of experience. He trains World Cup teams. We're all like, oh yeah, let's just knock them out. We, we could not like, we just couldn't like make it happen. We were like, it was very humbling and that was, that's exactly what I think what Amanda is saying. It's like, it's fun to work with, it's really simple and you, you're basically what you drew attention to. But you really, it just, it's, it stops you in your tracks. You're like, oh yeah, I can do this, it's no problem. I think you just pay attention to the parameters of temperature. One of the things we did learn is, is that we were trying to melt a very small amount. When you're working with chocolate, you melt it. You really have to melt a larger amount to work with it because it wants to, it, it crystallizes and cools so quickly. Mm -hmm. But we were, just, we were just getting cocky and we thought we could do it. Yes, sorry. A special type of the, oh the blender. Yeah, is it a special type because it was simply just moving very slowly. It's an immersion blender. You can change um, on this specific one. You can change the um, speed of it. Okay. I think most that you find you if it's not commercial are usually one or two speeds. But there's a lot out out on the market. Something nice about this is that it like the blade goes quite fast, um, so it makes a, a tight emulsion without bringing in the air. So like we talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then some of them have different, like this one has different types of blades. Mm -hmm. So some of them are just like flat cutting blades and then you want to make sure that uh, cutting that, like that type of surface, when you're shear, you're basically shearing it and just kind of blending it versus trying to incorporate too much air um, is important. But you can, there's a lot of really great uh, immersion circulators um, that you can buy at Sir La Table, William Sonoma, anybody, you know, they sell them. Yeah. Um, so now our um, ganache is finished. Um, so you can see now it's, it's thick. It'll hold its shape um, slightly when you put the spatula through it. It's very even um, and shiny. You don't want it to look like there's different kinds of fat. Um, you don't want the cocoa butter coming out or the, um, the regular butter coming out. So we're actually going to cast this into bars. Um, we have frames um, in production, so it yields exactly the um, ideal amount for us. Um, there's lots of different ways you could do this if you had bars at home. If you just had um, like a small baking sheet, you could line it with plastic wrap. Um, you could use, you know, an eight by eight glass pan. Whatever you have handy, that'd be fine. Um, and you can determine the thickness. Like for example, these particular bars are for making like, usually they're for caramel, cooking caramel and pouring it in there. So these particular bars are uh, 10 millimeters high, but you can get these bars at all these different thicknesses. When you pour it in the pan, you can either do it by weight. So like once you start we making it, weight. you can mm -hmm. do it by weight, which will determine the thickness. You're like, oh, I really like that. I wonder how much that weighs. Okay, that many grams or ounces is equivalent to X millimeters in that, or X you know, inches in that particular pan. Um, and so really you just kind of, you come up with your own systems. Uh, and that's what's, but you see how it's like very pudding-like? That's the, that's the most important part. So you see how when you pour it in, it's actually just sitting there, it's not moving. Now, if you were to create an emulsion, or you thought you created an emulsion, that, 
that was uh, good, and you pour it in, it just finds its level. It's completely, it's not emulsified at all. And then when, you, when it goes to set, when you set that chocolate, you'll run into all sorts of problems. The fat will separate, and you'll have a lot, a lot of issues with the actual emulsion. She makes it look so easy. All right. Right, right. It'd be like all over the floor. Yeah. Well, me too. That's why I had Amanda do it. Yeah. She's like. Well, you can. There's a. So the the question was, do we have any tips on how to melt chocolate at home? Um, very slowly. This is the most important thing. We melt ours like overnight, um, but if you're going to melt it, you shouldn't be in a rush to melt it quickly, especially if you're, um, you know, like for example, if you melt it at home, you can do use like a double boiler where you have a pot with water that you, if you bring it to a boil, turn it off and let it cool. Not cool, but let it, you know, just, you know, just, it's not at a boiling temperature and you have the heat off of it. Place the bowl on top of it and stir it and melt it that way, but never have the pot over boiling water. The problem with boiling water is, and water is if you get one little drop of water in the chocolate, it'll start to seize up and, and coagulate. Um, so it's really challenging to work with chocolate um, if you get water in. So if you have the bowl and you, pa you, know, you pass the wet bowl over and it drips into the chocolate and you stir it in, you're gonna run into a lot of problems. So you just have to be careful that you make sure that when you remove the bowl, you wipe the bottom of that bowl so you, um, remove any residual water from the, the, the process. Um, another way to do it is um, some people, um, well, we don't have, I don't think we, they, don't, they exist anymore, ovens with pilots. That's like, I shouldn't even talk about that. I'm like dating myself. Um, but if you have it, like we used to, in kitchens and restaurants, we used to just throw them in ovens with pilots overnight because it was like 100 plus degrees. So if you can find an area that's really low in, in temperature, um, you can melt it slowly. Um, so Amanda, right now, this is another important part. If you're, um, if you get into the dipping part of chocolate, what she's doing is that she's uh, bottoming it or backing it, and what that does is that it creates a very thin layer of of chocolate. Um, this is the milk chocolate that the chocolate that the actual lavender piece is coated in. Um, so if you say, for example, like if you're dipping this chocolate in a, in a bowl of liquid milk chocolate, you usually dip it with that side down, that the, the uh, milk chocolate side down mm -hmm. that's touching either like a fork or some sort of uh, item. You know, usually we use like dipping forks that are made for chocolate, but people's, I've seen people use forks, but the tine should be a little bit wider. Um, and then you just dip it into the chocolate, but that keeps it from sticking to the actual fork. Mm -hmm. This allows why. us to be able to move it around. So once this sets, um, you can actually pick it up and move it. You can see this ganache, um, it's basically two days after this. So you let it set, it's going to crystallize um, and release any excess moisture. Um, and then we're ready to finish it. So you could do a chablon, that's what that, um, that's the French term for the, that thin layer. Um, you could do that, and then you can actually flip that upside down. You can move it around if you need to cut it. Um, if you tried to do it with this one, as it gets warmer, it's, it's going to be harder and harder to work with. Um, so that just allows you a little bit more uh, leeway with that. Um, and that would be a perfect cue into tasting the milk chocolate. Um, so that's the little oval disc. So that milk chocolate is uh, specifically designed for us um, from, that we did a custom blend with Valrona. So Jackie and I actually spent time in the south of France working with Valrona to do a sensory evaluation of, uh, of this particular chocolate. This is a 45% and a lot of milk chocolates are l much lower than 45%, so that means it has a lot of cacao in it. This is a, a percentage of Dominican Republic, uh, which is 70%, and it's 30% uh, Mexican from the Oaxaca area. Um, the, uh, 45% is very high. They really weren't into it at the time. They thought, well, that's a little bit too high. You're not going to taste all the, the really wonderful flavors of the milk. So we played around with different types of milk solids, powdered milk. So they used a, like, a, a, like a buttermilk, powdered buttermilk. And then they used the clabbered cream, which is like a cream that has a little bit of, it's a little sour. And it's in a dried powder that they added to it. So it could really draw out some of that milk flavor. Um, versus like if you had a lower percentage, you could add just like a regular high fat 
a dry powdered milk to it to have a milk chocolate flavor. Um, but we were just looking for something a little bit more intense. It doesn't lose that milk chocolate flavor, but you taste more of the actual cacao, the chocolate. And I think that was, was really important for us. When Jackie and I were tasting it, we really wanted to make sure that we could taste that particular, taste the chocolate and not just it being really sweet and milky. We wanted it to be like this like middle ground. We also knew that we were coating other pieces with it. So that was the other. Oh, I mean, how it's, yeah. So the, so the crystallization is basically, um, you know, when we talk about chocolate, um, what we're talking about as far as uh, the crystallization is, is that, you know, that you have your cocoa butter and you have your sugar and you have your, your, all of your solids there. So when you're melting chocolate down, for example, like if you're, if you're tempering chocolate, you're bringing cho cho chocolate has cocoa butter melts at a very specific temperature, which is anywhere from like 84 to, you know, 84 to 85, 86 degrees. And then sugar melts at like 112 to 113 degrees. So when you're melting chocolate, you have to make sure that you bring it up to the temperature where you melt the cocoa butter and then you bring it up and you melt the actual um, sugar and you break those crystals down and they're starting to float around. And then as you slowly cool it, you're cooling it to the point where the two are linking together, like the beta crystals are linking together. And you have, the, 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 you, you have a really nice crystallization, which when it cools, it'll harden. If you just melt chocolate and cool it, the, sh the fat and the sugar will stay separate. They won't link back up and so you won't have any strength and you have a really bad crystallization. Um, so what Amanda would do here in this particular case is, is that she would go through a tempering process of tempering the chocolate. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about your uh, tempering philosophy. Um, there's a lot of ways to think about tempering, but the crystallization and, and, and making, maintaining chocolate so that it stays hard um, once it's cooled, it's really important. It doesn't separate. What we, if you don't, if you're not crystallizing chocolate, and you're just melting it. And like, say, for example, like if you're just rolling truffles and melted chocolate, then you should refrigerate it because it kind of maintains its structure. But as you, when you pull it out of the refrigerator, that chocolate, that coating will become really soft. It'll start to break down because it, it hasn't linked up. The fats and the sugars haven't linked up, so it doesn't really harden properly. And you also run into bloom. You run into separation of mm -hmm. like the fats separate from the chocolate itself. So that's why you see like a white halo of co coating there. Mm -hmm. So um, once you have your Chablon and it's finished and um, set, you can flip it over, you can start to cut, and then you can decide how you want to finish it. So um, I sifted some cocoa powder, just did a quick roll um, into the cocoa powder and then sifted again. You don't want too much um, cocoa powder on the outside. It is typically pretty bitter. I don't know about most of you, but I actually breathe in right before I eat things and I don't like a lot of cocoa powder right before. So, um, so that's the little extra sifting at the end, which you should have one piece that looks very similar to that. Um, next to that would be one that's finished um, on our enrobing machine. So same um, setup, they'd be cut, and then you could either hand dip them in crystallized chocolate, um, or if you're lucky like us, you can send it through your enrobing machine, have it do it for you. Um, and then we brought um, some of the cocoa butter transfers just so you could see what it looks like. Um, they're basically silk-screened cocoa butter um, in whatever design that you, you would like. These are actually, Jackie was just telling me this story, which I didn't even know until this morning, um, but this was a, a Japanese wood, wood block. Wood block print, print yeah. Um, that they had specifically made for our lavender vanilla um, truffle. We figured so. it was like from what, the 11th century or something, so maybe we wouldn't run into any issues. Any copyright issues? Yeah, there? yeah, we're like, ah, it's really old. No yeah. one's ever gonna know. We have our lemon verbena as a wood block that uh, I think Jackie picked, you picked up these really beautiful books of these uh, wood block prints and, the, and then you started kind of going through them and that's how we came up with some of these designs. Um, so the transfer sheets uh, we use a lot. We also use them, uh, we do a lot of cu custom or corporate pieces. Um, so we have the images, it's basically like the, 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 this um, acetate or this plastic can be, it, it, picture it being like a eight and a half by 11 sheet of acetate or plastic and it goes through like a, a machine that ha instead of having ink, it has 
cocoa butter that has different colors, you know, and then it just prints onto it. So it prints the image onto this piece of plastic. And when the image, when the chocolate's wet, we place this on top of the wet chocolate. And as the chocolate cools, for, our, for us, it goes through a long cooling tunnel that's like 20 some odd mm -hmm. feet long. And when it reaches the other end, we let it sit overnight and then we remove the, the, the piece the plastic and then the image transfers to the surface of the chocolate which you'll see in this little square here is the lavender has the little the little wood block image transferred onto it amazing yeah. so delicious thank you guys so much um does anybody have any questions in our last little bit of and feel time. free to taste these two chocolates yeah, you have questions? Um, <laughs> i'm a rule breaker i already i already <laughs> tasted mine oh you did okay were you <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to know if that last step is purely aesthetic or if that has any practical value for the, the tasting of the chocolate. It does actually have a practical value because um, once, once the ganache is like this, they all typically look the same. Um, if it's a dark chocolate ganache, um, we have to keep them very well labeled because we have, you know, dozens of flavors. Yeah. yeah. And so um, being able to apply a different look to it after it's enrobed um, not only helps us differentiate, but also our customers, right? So that they know which, which piece, which flavor they're buying. So it looks pretty, but it also uh, does have a function, so. So for an amateur, where can we go to get good chocolate for making chocolate? There is a lot of... Uh, yeah, there's uh, a lot, there's a lot of chocolate it. available. Um, there's, there's, there's purveyors of chocolate online that sell like all sorts of crazy origin bland, brand, brands, blends, um, that you can get in just various quantities from like a four ounce bar to, you know, larger quantities that you can work with. You can also buy um, cacao beans from different areas of the world. Um, and you, you can do that. I mean, thing, places like, I mean, Whole Foods has, you know, a lot, they carry a fair amount of the Valron line and some other stuff that you can buy in bulk. Um, but it, uh, it, I think I would say that it, you could really get some cool stuff online. The thing is, is that you want to, you also want to be able to taste it, you want, you know, before you buy it. And sometimes when you buy these really beautiful chocolates, they're more for eating than they are for making confections. So a lot of these uh, chocolate makers, these bean to bar uh, makers, are making these gorgeous chocolates, and it's almost, you know, it, it's it's nice when you make a ganache with it. I mean, it's great for home. It's, it wouldn't be smart for us because it's, it's, they're really expensive. But also, just it's they're nice. They're nice to just eat on their own. So right. we we come up with like really premium chocolate that has like a middle ground flavor where, you know, there's all these red fruits, yellow fruits, you know, nice tobacco notes, but nothing too extreme. So that we know we're blending it and we know we're dipping it and we're going to come up with those flavor profiles. For example, on this one, the lavender vanilla, obviously the chocolate is the, a main flavor there, but we don't want the chocolate flavor to overpower the lavender and the vanilla. We want it to complement it. Um, so we would use a chocolate that doesn't have a whole lot of like pizzazz on its own. Whereas maybe if you just wanted that flavor to come through, you'd use a very flavorful chocolate, but not do an infusion. It would just be about the chocolate. But I would say when you're looking to buy quality chocolate, make sure to check the ingredients that there's not um, any other added fats. You want to make sure it's only cocoa butter, no palm oils, nothing like that. Um, it's not going to act the same way, um, and you won't be able to crystallize it like you would a couverture, um, you know, high quality chocolate. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about um, how you pair this with wine or liqueur. Like generally, how do you think about pairing this with alcohol? It's challenging. I think for um, for pairing chocolates or chocolate with alcohol or wine or liqueurs, uh, it's easier to do some of our confections um, because they have other ingredients and they also have you know butter and fats. Um, when you're just doing straight up chocolate, especially like really high percentage cacao, um, it they all they have a lot of acids and tannins present. And if you say, for example, pairing it with wine, they also have a lot of acids and tannins present. So when you bring the two together, it's, it can be very difficult. It's not that it doesn't work. You just have to be mindful of it. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, Cabernet is really good with like 80%. Well, it's not. It's like hard. It's really difficult to taste it. Um, or, and or if you start like tasting chocolates that have acids in them, for example, like we have candied orange peel. Um, so if you taste candied orange peel that's coated in chocolate, 
with a wine or with something else. It's just going to draw out all these really kind of in these unpleasant flavor profiles. But it's subjective as well. You know, you might think that it tastes really good and I might not like it at all. So I think it's finding that middle ground. And there's, a lot, there's, enough, there's enough people that do tastings. We like ports, sherries, and Madeiras to taste with because they have this, some of that sweet quality and they have some of the lower levels of acids and tannins. And it really draws out. And Jackie was doing a tasting at our lab space um, when we had it in, the, in San Francisco, which we'll probably be doing. The, you know, again, we have a retail store in, in Dogpatch called The Lab. Um, and we, she did a flight of different uh, sherries and Madeiras, like chocolates and sherries and Madeiras, and she just nailed it. It was really good. But it's challenging. It was challenging for her as well to do it. Oh. Yeah, and we have like a note card in the box that, you know, has the, the chocolate that we suggest you pair it with. Not the actual brand, but the type, if it's like a Pinot or, or something else, that, we, that would work. So once it's enrobed, um, like the piece that has the transfer on it, um, it's usually four to six weeks, right? When you eat it fresh after it's enrobed, it has a slightly different taste and texture than it would six weeks from then. Um, nothing's going to go bad in your, in your bonbon from that time period. But depending on what your infusion is, um, maybe the flavor would dissipate over time. Um, depending on where it's stored, perhaps it would lose some of the moisture and maybe wouldn't have as creamy of a texture. Um, well, the other thing is, is that just really a quick example is like when we make this, when you make this ganache here, it's really good to actually let it sit. Um, I mean, we have it sitting in a room that's like 60 some odd degrees, 50 percent humidity for for curing. It's very much like cheese, like when you're doing effinage with cheese where you're ripening the cheese and you're aging it and turning it. But with chocolate as well, like if you make it and then like coat it, not immediately because it won't work like this, but if you coat it like very quickly, you, you want, the uh, air actually builds on flavor. So as it sits, it kind of starts to build on flavor and also some of the, the, some of the moisture that's present mm -hmm. goes away because there is a little bit of moisture here. So if you, if you encapsulate it quickly with chocolate, you're going to capture some of that moisture and that's where mold and bacteria can mm -hmm. form. But it's very much like making wine. You have wine in a barrel and then it's aging and fermenting in the barrel or you're just getting building on those flavors. Once you pull it out of the barrel and you bottle it, it's like bottle shock. You start to, you know, you start to slow down that whole process. That's where you can just build your futures and the flavor profiles. But with chocolate, it's the same thing. Once you coat it with chocolate, it slows down any sort of like flavor um, and oxygen or air. And it basically, you know, coating it with chocolate is like wrapping it in cellophane, you know, it just keeps it stable it's also just another texture and flavor profile but it really it really kind of extends the life if you just had it by itself it would last it wouldn't last as long but i i i we say that we like to just keep it for a little bit you know before we coat it you know let it sit mm -hmm. like if you don't get to it you don't have to like make it and use it you know it, it'll actually build on flavor yeah. a lot so of things takes better a little older. Like the hand-rolled truffles, right? They don't have any coating of chocolate on the outside. So you'd want to eat these within a couple days, one or two days, right? But if it's coated and completely um, surrounded in it chocolate. It preserves it, yeah. yeah. It's going to block out any kind of transfer of moisture and things like that. Great. Thank you guys so much. You're welcome.